that our salvation is more valuable than cars. And yet, people are giving away their salvation. The title of this morning's sermon is called, Don't Give Your Salvation Away. Before I explain the context of my title, I think it is important for me to show you through scriptures that you can lose your salvation. For instance, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to read verse 36 to 39. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 36 to 39, before I explain the context of my title concerning don't give your salvation away, I would like to show you through scripture that the scriptures teach clearly and plainly that we can lose our salvation. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 36, in fact, we can read 35, cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them, who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. The scripture says, we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. The word perdition means spiritual ruin or spiritual destruction. Many have tasted the good word of God. Many have tasted the forgiveness of sins. Many have tasted what it means to be a Christian, having a relationship with God through Christ. And what do they do? Instead of staying consistent, instead of staying faithful, they draw back unto spiritual ruin. They give their salvation away. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Jude. There's only one chapter in the book of Jude. Jude chapter 1. We're going to read verse 3 through 7, Jude chapter 1, and we are going to read verse 3 through 7. And as we read the warnings that Jude gives to us Christians, these warnings will not hold any weight unless one can lose their salvation. These warnings will not hold any weight unless one can lose their salvation. Jude chapter 1, beginning with verse 3 through 7, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in, in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he gives a warning. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he had reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. These warnings that Jude gives us would hold no weight if we cannot lose our salvation. If we can never lose our salvation, what is the purpose of Jude warning us? I want you to be mindful that God delivered the people out of the land of Egypt, and later on, he destroyed the very ones he saved. I want you to be mindful 
about Sodom and Gomorrah. I want you to be mindful about the angels that sinned against God and chose not to stay in their dwelling place, but left their own habitation. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. I want you to be mindful of these things because if God can do that to Sodom and Gomorrah, if God can do that to the angels, and if God can do that to the Jews, God can do it to you as well. That's the whole point. Now notice, if you would, in Romans chapter 11, I just want to show you some verses out of the many verses that clearly teach we can lose our salvation. And that's why I'm trying to exhort you today, don't give your salvation away. Romans, if you would, chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Verse 17 through 22. Romans chapter 11, verse 17 to 22, we understand when Christ came into the world and preached the gospel, the first audience that he focused upon was the Jews. But then the Jews as a whole rejected the gospel of Christ, and then the apostles turned to the Gentiles. In this particular chapter, Apostle Paul is telling the Gentiles, be careful that you do not be high-minded, but realize if God can easily disconnect the natural olive branch, which are the Jews, God can also disconnect you, which is the unnatural olive branch as well. So Romans chapter 11, verse 17 to 22. Romans chapter 11, verse 17 to 22. And as some of the branches were broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, were graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou stands by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. What should we fear? Verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. Paul gives the Gentile Christian a serious warning. Paul said in verse 22 that if we do not continue in the goodness of God, God will also cut us, or excuse me, cut us off. There are many verses that strongly declares that we can lose our salvation. But because of the sake of time, these scriptures will suffice. Now let me explain the context of my title. Let me explain the context of my title. Don't give your salvation away. There are many ways in which we can give our salvation away. We know Judas gave his salvation away because of greed. We can also give our salvation away through the love of money. We can also give our salvation away through false teachings. But today, I would like to focus on one specific way that we can give our salvation away, and that is unresolved anger towards someone. If you want to remain angry, you are giving your salvation away. People are going to hurt us. We at one time, and I'm sure we still do it, hurt others, whether purposely or not. People who are not governed by the Spirit of God will hurt us. Even people in the church. People will hurt us by the things they say. People will hurt us by the things they do. And people will hurt us by the things they don't do. It's a fact of life. Some of us have been hurt by maybe our parents. Some kids have been abused by their mom and dad. Physically speaking, some kids have been abused sexually by a loved one. 
Some people have been hurt. And until the Lord returns, I believe that we are going to get hurt over and over and over and over again. I want to give you some examples of righteous people that were innocent, that were hurt by people close to them. Let's go to Genesis chapter 37, if you would. Genesis chapter 37. Here we find a young man by the name of Joseph that was tragically hurt by his brothers. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 3 through 11, Genesis chapter 37, verse 3 through 11, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved Joseph more than all of them, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, Joseph was innocent. It was not Joseph's doing that merited his brothers hating him. His father is the one that showed favoritism and partiality. But Joseph was innocent. And as a result, his brothers hated him and could not speak peaceably unto their brother. Sometimes people will hate us. They don't like us. And we may be innocent. It has nothing to do with us. Now, later on, I'm going to explain this. Sometimes, so I'm not saying it's justifiable, but sometimes we merit the mistreatment from others by things that we do to them. But in this case, Joseph was innocent. He did nothing wrong, and yet his brothers hated him. And as we read on, it says in verse 6, verse 5, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we are binding sheaves in the field, and my sheep arose. My sheep, is that how you pronounce it? I'm using the King James in a singular. My sheep, and if I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize. My sheep arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and started to bow down to my sheep. And his brethren said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren. And said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bow down to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to you and bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. They were jealous. Can people do hurtful things out of a heart of jealousy? Can people do hurtful things out of a heart of hate? They hated their brother. They were jealous of his brother. And then notice what they did to him. Let's go ahead and drop down, if you would, in verse 18 to 36. And when they saw him afar off, that's his brothers, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. You talk about being, mis you talk about being mistreated. They conspired as they saw their brother approaching him. Let's get rid of him. Let's kill him. That's hurtful. From his own brothers. Has your own family hurt you? From his own brothers. 
Verse 19, and they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we shall say, Some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will, what, what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph from his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. You wonder what was going in the mind of Joseph when his brothers got a hold of him and began to strip him from his coat. You wonder what was going on in his mind. Verse 24, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. You wonder what went through his mind when his own brother stripped him from his coat and threw him in a pit. Is that hurtful? Is that mean? Is that what we call mistreatment? Now, I, unless I'm wrong, I don't think any one of us have been stripped from a coat of many colors, and I don't think any one of us have been put in a pit physically, but have we not experienced some of those uh, side effects that someone would experience when they're being mistreated, hurt, sadness, disappointed, anger. And then notice, if you would, in verse 25, And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and looked. And behold, a company of the Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then there, then there passed by, by Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. Can you imagine if Joseph being lifted up out of the pit? He's looking at his brothers as they force him to be sold as a slave. Hey, brother, what are you doing? You don't think he's going to miss his father? You don't think he's wondering about his dad? Hey, my father just sent me to see how you guys are doing, and now you're going to sell me as a slave? You talk about hurt. Verse 28, And they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt, and Reuben returned unto the pit. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat, and killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father, and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn in pieces. And Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold Joseph into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain of the guard. If anyone had a justifiable right to be angry, would it be Joseph? We don't have time to go through this, but you know, later on in the story, after Joseph suffered tremendously, that Pharaoh elevated him to second in command of all of Egypt, and there was a great famine, and Joseph, through his infinite wisdom that God gave him, was able to have Egypt store enough food to last him through the famine. And guess who needed food? His family. And they traveled into Egypt. And now I'm just going to fast forward here. Eventually, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, and his brothers thought, surely our brother is going to take vengeance. Surely our brother is going to do unto us what we have done unto him. And you know what Joseph said? What you intended for evil, God intended for good. 
And Joseph says, you go back and you get my father. And I want all you guys to move into Egypt. I'm going to give you the best land. And I'm going to make sure you are provided for. For God used your mistreatment to put me in this place at this time to bless you. Now, what if Joseph would have been like many of us? Angry. Upset. Poor me. Bitter. On and on, re-echoing in our mind and playing it over and over. What the hurtful things that were said, the hurtful things that was done. If you were Joseph and you saw your brothers, it's my time. It's my turn. I'm going to get revenge. And Joseph did not deserve the mistreatment that he received from his brothers. There's many people that have gone through things that you don't deserve to go through. You were innocent in the situation. It was not your fault. Evil was inflicted upon you. Pain was inflicted upon you. But what are you going to do if you allow that pain to become unresolved anger in your life? Unresolved anger that follows you every day. Unresolved anger that not only follows you every day, but you do your very best. Maybe you don't, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. But you do your very best to hide it. I don't want anyone to know. But you cannot keep something in your heart for too long before it comes out. It will come out. Apostle Paul was another man that was mistreated. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Go to 2 Timothy Chapter 4. Now, Joseph was mistreated by his own brothers. Apostle Paul is a servant of the Lord. He devoted himself in helping the church. And in this context, you would think that his devotion merited the church's support to be there for him when he needed them. But as you're going to see, that even the church forsook Apostle Paul. Sometimes we put this crazy expectation that the church should never disappoint me because they're the church. The church should never let me down because they're the church. But yet we find Apostle Paul saying the church forsook him when he needed them the most. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16 through 17. Apostle Paul said, at my first answer, how many people stood by him? Where's the church? Where's the people that you call brothers and sisters in Christ? Where are the people that say, I got your back. You're my brother in Christ. I got your back. You're my sister in Christ. I will be there for you until the very end. He said, at my first, no man stood by me. And then he said, but all men forsook me. He's talking about the church. No man stood by me. All men forsook me. But notice his forgiving heart. I pray to God that God will not lay this to their charge. <laughs> he didn't go back home like some of us and we're all stirred up, having a bad Sunday, having a bad Wednesday, all stirred up. I can't believe that brother said this. I can't believe that sister says this. Who gives them the right? To talk to me that way. And we start calling another Christian and start, start gossiping on the phone. Apostle Paul didn't do that. He says, no man stood by me, but all men forsook me. But I pray that God will not lay this to their charge. In other words, I pray that God will forgive them for not sticking by me. I pray that God will forgive them for not supporting me. I pray that God will forgive them for not being there for me as they should.
Then we look at the best example, Jesus. Go to Matthew chapter 26, if you would. Matthew chapter 26. As I was getting ready to take the Lord's Supper, I started thinking about Christ. And I started thinking how Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. I, I started playing that, those story, uh, those scriptures in that story over, starting from the beginning when Judas approached Christ. He was betrayed by Judas. How they arrested Christ. How they took him to the high priest in the palace of the high priest. And how they had this illegal court hearing. And then how they began to falsely accuse Jesus. And then when Jesus said to the high priest, after the high priest says, I adjure thee by the living God, tell us whether or not you are the Christ. And Jesus says, verily you, you say the truth. And the high priest tore his clothing and he says, we have heard the blasphemy of this man. What do you think he's worthy of? And they all said death. And then after that, they begin to hit Jesus with a, a rod, with their fists. Then they begin to put, a, a, they, they blindfolded him. And then they struck him. And they said, Lord, if you're the son of God, let us know which one of us hit you out of mockery. And then the Bible says they spat on him. And then you go later on in that story how Pilate wanted to release Jesus, but he was afraid that if he did that, there was going to be a riot takes place that took place. Sort of like what's going on today when people don't get their way, they start to riot. We want change, and if we don't get change, we'll show you violence. So uh, Pilate was aware of that potential threat. So in order to satisfy, in his mind, the crowd, he says, I'll just have Jesus being flogged. Then they took our Lord and they just uh, exposed his body and they begin to flog Christ. Flog Christ. Flog Christ. And you can imagine the amount of blood that Jesus lost. Not even the crucifixion, but you can imagine the blood of Christ, how much blood he lost when they were flogging him. And then they took him to the cross and they nailed him to the cross. And you know what? Even Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 4 makes it very clear. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you faint and be weary in your minds. You have not resisted blood striving against sin. Is that true? Yes. Not one of us has ever experienced that kind of torment striving to be a Christian. And so Jesus is the lamb without spot, without blemish. He was innocent. He didn't do anything to merit this treatment. The Bible says they hated him without a cause. Jesus could have got angry. Jesus could have put up a fight. Go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 47 through 50. 47, and while he yet, and while Jesus yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude of swords and staffs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, arrest him. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Is that hurtful when you're betrayed by someone close to you? Someone that you thought you can rely on? Someone that you thought you can count on? Someone you thought that will never do anything harmful towards you? Someone that you thought that's not going to hurt you? And yet they betray you. Then when you read verse 55 and 56, same chapter, Matthew 26, verse 55 and 56, in that same hour said Jesus to the multitude, are you come out as against a thief with swords and staffs for the taking? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled and notice the last part of that verse. 
Then all, how many? All, all the disciples forsook him. Peter forsook him. James forsook him. Matthew forsook him. Thomas forsook him. Bartholomew forsook him. There was another Judas that was an apostle. Forsook him. All his apostles forsook him. Is it hurtful when you get forsaken by people that you thought you could depend on? Where are these people when you're going through your battle? Where are these people when you're going through your trouble? Where are they? The same people that used to have fun with you and hang out with you and have a good time with you. And then all of a sudden, when you go through some, calam calam through some calamities, where are these people? They're nowhere to be found. That's hurtful. And then go to chapter 69, verse 75. Excuse me, not chapter, I'm sorry. Chapter 26, verse 69 through 75. 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a young woman came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But Peter denied but Peter denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again Peter denied with an oath, I do not know the man. I do not know the man. Now, I'm not going to go into the account of Luke, but according to Luke, Jesus was not too far off from Peter when Peter was saying, I know not the man. Jesus saw them. I know not the man. Peter, we were just eating together. And now Peter's saying, I don't know this man. Peter, remember, it's me. I helped you walk on water. And now Peter says, I don't know the man. Peter, remember when we were in the boat and I told you to cast a net on the right side and then a multitude of fish began to pound the net to the extent we had to get other assistance from other people in other boats? Remember that night? And you told me, Lord, depart from me for I'm a sinful man? It's me. Peter says, I know not the man. The very one that was close to Christ and said, Lord, even if all the disciples abandon you, even if all the disciples deny you, I will not deny you. I'm ready to go to prison, and Lord, I'm ready to die for you. Is that hurtful to know that someone's denying you? The reason why I wanted to give the example of Joseph, Apostle Paul, and Jesus, to show you that we all, I'm not saying we can relate to Christ, but as far as all of us have been hurt, all of us have been hurt, whether it's our family members, whether it's the members in the church, whether it's just close people in general, every one of us has been hurt. And you know what's sad? People are giving their salvation away. And I'll explain. I did before, but I'm going to explain again. Some people hurt us because they might be repaying us for how we treated them. And other times, like Jesus, like Apostle Paul, and like Joseph, and other times people hurt us, and we have done nothing wrong to merit that hurt. Whenever someone hurts us, someone we love, someone that's close to us, someone that we would never expect to hurt us, whenever someone hurts us, what is the human reaction whenever someone hurts us? What is our human reaction... I doubt it is, hey, let me buy you dinner. <laughs> let me buy you lunch. I, I doubt it. If that's your human reaction, that's great. But our human reaction is this. We become angry. We become angry. Because of the hurt we receive from people that we care about, people that we love, we become angry. Afterwards. 
we become angry. And because of anger, we have the tendency to say things that displeases the Lord. And because of anger, we also have the tendency to do something that is contrary to the name we profess, which is, I'm a Christian. And we might go around and gossip about this person to others, which is a sin. All of this, if we are not careful, can cause us to lose our salvation. Is it worth losing your salvation over someone that hurts you? Is it worth being cast into everlasting fire when Jesus says, depart from me, I know you not? Is it worth to be cast into everlasting fire because of unresolved anger that you still harbor, unresolved anger that you still carry, unresolved anger that you continue to re-echo and replay in your mind over and over and over? Time passes, things change, but not you. We're still the same person because of unresolved anger. This is not a part of my sermon, but let me just say this. You're never going to have joy with unresolved anger. You're never going to have peace with unresolved anger. You're never going to have happiness in Christ with unresolved anger. You're never going to have true harmony in your relationships with unresolved anger. Anger is going to hold you back from living life as a Christian, and unresolved anger is going to send you into hell fire. Now, how can anger cause me to lose my salvation? That's a rhetorical question, not looking for a, a verbal response. It's a rhetorical question. How can anger cause me to lose my salvation? Anger potentially can cause us to say things contrary to the will of God. Can we say some very hurtful, mean things out of anger. You're thinking, okay, but it's not like I killed the person. It's not like I was driving in my vehicle and I saw him crossing the street and I said, oh no, this is my opportunity, you know, and just run him over. It's not like I did that. I just said some words. It's not a big deal to say some words, is it? Well, let's see what Jesus says about our words. Can our words condemn us? Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. This is how unresolved anger can cause us to lose or give our salvation away. Notice in Matthew chapter 12. Be careful when you're angry what words you utter. Be careful when you're angry what words you utter. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 to 37. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 to 37. Jesus said, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. Old generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Did everybody catch that? We're not even talking about actions. We're not talking about going down the street to a liquor store and buying alcohol. We're not talking about going down the street and committing a crime. We're not talking about actions. We're talking about words. Can your words, according to what we're about to read, send you to hell? 
Yeah. And then notice what he says. Verse 37. For by your words thou shalt be justified, and by your words thou shalt be condemned. So how can unresolved anger cause us to give our salvation away. If we don't resolve our anger, can anger influence our speech towards someone or toward or to others about that someone? Be careful what we say when we're angry. Because by your words, Thou shalt be justified, and by your words, thou shalt be condemned. I want you to think about that. I want that to soak in your minds and hearts right now. Now, listen, just a thought. If, if our words are that serious, should we be a little bit more selective? And what we say. Should we have a little bit more consideration of what we say before we say it? How many believe the words of Christ in that passage? Do you believe that? That someone that commits murder is going to go to hell, but the person that uses words that is contrary to the word of God is going to be with that murderer in hell just the same. Just the same. You will be cast into the lake of fire with a murderer by just uttering words that are contrary to the word of God. Just the same. That's what the Bible says. Is it important to resolve our anger so our anger does not influence our speech and our speech says things that are contrary to the word of God and by our words we're going to be condemned? Is it important to resolve our anger? Another way anger can cause us to lose our salvation and we give our salvation away through anger, unresolved anger. Anger can cause us to not live peaceably with all men. Remember the story that we read about Joseph, that his brothers were not able to speak peaceably with their brother? You get someone that's angry towards someone, and you say, I got an assignment for you. I want you to live in harmony with this person. I want you to get along with this person. I want you to be peaceably with this person. I want you to live peaceably with this person. Or be peace, peaceful. Peace, yeah, be peaceful to that person. I don't know how. You know what I'm saying. Now, talking about salvation, we're talking about salvation issues. Is it, is it a salvation issue for us to live peaceably with all men? Is it a salvation issue? Well, let's go to Scripture. Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews, chapter 12. 14 and 15. Hebrews, chapter 12. 14 and 15. You might emphasize holiness. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. It, the scripture doesn't say that. It says, follow peace and holiness. Just like Mark chapter 16, verse 16. The reason why we emphasize being baptized, because the Bible says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So I want you to see the scripture says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And by the way, how does holiness and following peace with all men work together? This is how. How can you have holy thoughts holy words, holy actions with people you don't want to be at peace with at all because you're angry. 
So notice if you would in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. How many want to see God one day? We, we talk about seeing God. Soon and very soon, I'm going to see the King. According to the scripture, you're not going to see God in heaven. You're going to see God on judgment. But you're not going to see God in heaven without following peace with all men. So that person that you're angry with, you're going to let that person stop you from seeing God one day? You're, you're going to let that person who you're angry with Stop you from seeing God one day. Is it really worth it to stay angry at someone and let that person be the reason that you're not going to see God one day? You're going to go through this temple road with unresolved anger and bitterness, and I don't want to talk to that person. I don't want anything to do with that person. I hate that person. I can't stand that person. I'm still angry at that person. You're going to go through this temple road holding on to your anger, and it's going to cost you eternity, not being able to see God one day. You're going to let that person be the reason why you give your salvation away. Like I said, it's like me giving a house away. It's like me giving a car away. Just giving it away. You think, how are you going to give your house away? That's valuable. Where are you going to live? That's crazy for you to give your house away. It costs you money. Yeah, it's even more crazy to see people in the church with unresolved anger giving their expensive and valuable and priceless salvation away because of what people did to them. Because of what people said to them. I want you to keep this in mind. We've all been hurt by words or by someone's actions or someone's lack of actions. You're going to really stay angry? Really? You're going to forfeit your opportunity to see God one day because of anger toward this person? That's, that's how you want to end this life? That's how you want to go out? That's how you want to wake up every morning and live your day to day every week? Is angry? The scriptures in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15, we didn't read verse 15, but it says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail. Of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be contaminated or defiled. This scripture says that if we do not follow peace with all men, we will not see God. Yes, my friends, unresolved anger can cause us to give our salvation away. Is being angry toward others worth our salvation? This is why Apostle Paul exhorts us not to let the sun go down upon our wrath. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. Be you angry and sin not. The anger in itself is not a sin. It is what the anger influences us to say or do. But not only did he say, be you angry, sin not, he also exhorts us not to let the sun go down upon your wrath. Because even if you're angry and it still has not caused you to sin by what you say and what you do, if you allow that anger to stay and remain, it's going to grow, and it's going to get stronger. And then eventually, it's going to cause you to sin. So the Bible said in verse 26, Be you angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Yesterday, as I rode my bike with Quinn, we had an opportunity to witness the beautiful sunset. That sun was going down. That sun went down on you yesterday, too. Did it go down on your wrath? Did you wake up this morning still angry? Did you wake up this morning still upset? 
Now, when you're angry, it doesn't mean, well, the sun just came up, so I got all day <laughs> before the sun goes down to get rid of this anger. So I'm just going to enjoy it while, while I can. No, it's saying, deal with it. Get rid of it. And then the next verse says this. Verse 27, neither give place to the devil. You know what that is saying in the context of anger? If you allow anger to remain, guess who you gave place to come in and influence you? The devil. You come to church service with anger, you can see how the devil is using that area in that person's life to disrupt the whole service. Get people saying things and doing things because they allowed unresolved anger to stay in their heart and they gave place to the devil to use that little spot of anger to influence them to do things, say things that disrupt the harmony of the church. We see it all the time. How do we resolve our human anger is what I want to talk about next. How do we resolve our human anger. When someone has hurt you, did you first, initially, first, react by saying, you know what? I'm going to God right now. I'm not, I'm not going to go another second holding this thing. I'm going to God. I'm going to cry out unto the Lord, and I'm going to pour out my heart to God, and I'm going to I know God already knows, but I'm going to express myself to God and say, God, I am hurt. What this person did to me, what this person said to me, it has pained me awfully. It has hurt me. Is that the way we react? We, right away we go to God? I believe that pouring our heart and crying out to God whenever someone hurts us, is a good step in the right direction. God wants you to take your hurt to Him. I, I didn't write these scriptures down, but on your own, you can kind of seek for it in Pro, uh, Psalm chapter 34, how the Bible says, the righteous cry, yeah. and the Lord delivers them out of their trouble. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them, them from them all. Does the church need to do more crying unto God whenever we are badly hurt by someone? Yes. We do. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, be anxious for nothing. I know we're talking about anxiety, but I think anger can really stir up our anxiety even more. Yes. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall guard or protect all the agitations that we go through. How many have minds sometimes that is very agitated? Right? God says, my peace that passes all understanding shall protect you from all the agitation. But we got to go to God in prayer in everything. What about praying for those who hurt us? Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. You can read that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. And Jesus said unto them, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that pray, uh, do good to them that hate you. And then it says, Pray for them. Pray for them which despitefully use you. You think if we pray for our enemies that God can use that moment of prayer as a as a as a, a point where he can transform our heart. It's very hard to pray for someone with good intentions. You're, I'm not talking about, Lord, <laughs> send fire from heaven and devour this person. This is what my prayer. You told me to pray for my enemy, so God, I'm just being real. There's a lot of car accidents and innocent people are getting hit by cars. So let this person get hit by a car. And that's my prayer, Lord, because... You'll be doing the world justice by, you know, getting rid of this bad person, you know. No, God's not saying praying for misfortune. Praying that God may bless them. 
I guarantee you, if you pray for people that are hurting you, it's just a matter of time before your heart is going to be, is going to change your attitude toward them. You can't pray for someone and, Lord, please bless them and help them, Lord, and strengthen them and please bring them a salvation and be with their, you know, families and help them, Lord. I know they must be miserable. You know, hurt people, hurt people. Mean people, hurt people. That's just the way it is. People are mean because they're dealing with a bunch of hurt that they have not given to you completely, Lord. So let them disclose their hurt to you. Let them go to you with all this hurt that you may change them from within to without. Lord, that they can see that you have so much to offer than all this anger and all the cloudy, uh, how the clouds of anger disrupts our vision and judgment. And I guarantee you, you pray for someone over and over. Eventually, you're not going to be angry anymore. You're not going to be angry. So let me ask you a question, okay? When someone hurts you the last time, you got that person in your mind? Okay. If it's me, I'm sorry. Okay. I want to know. I don't want to know. I want you to. I want you to think. I want you to think. The most recent situation when someone hurt you. And then I have a question. Did you pray for that person? That's the question. Because if you pray for that person, you are obeying Jesus. He said, pray for your enemies. Pray for them. They need salvation too. They need salvation too. Pray for them. And if you haven't prayed for them, then you have not obeyed the Lord. Because he said, pray for them. Here's another way to overcome unresolved anger. Overcome their evil treatment by doing good to them. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 through 21. Go there real quick. I'll just quote it. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 through 21. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will repay. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him water. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be now overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. Put that to the test. Put that to the test. I know my dad, I told you this before, he, he still has the same neighbor, but a long time ago, that neighbor was not very neighborly and was always mistreating my dad directly and indirectly. And my dad kept on being good to him. Whenever there was a need, he would go to the house and offer his help. And in time, he won him over. And now I can say that they're almost like best friends. And one time, another neighbor across the street that was committing domestic violence with his wife and kids challenged my dad to a fight. So that neighbor that was mistreating my dad, in which my dad won over to his side and they became best buddies, he got involved. And he says, you want to get to him, you're going to have to get to me. While the neighbor across the street that was trying to pick on my dad I guess he grabbed one of his babies, like, I can't fight you, and I got a baby in my hand. <laughs> but you know what my dad did? My dad could have said, forget this neighbor. He keeps on mistreating me. Whenever I say hi, he doesn't say hi back. I'm not going to say hi to him. That's how we act. I'm not, I'm not going out of my way to acknowledge him. If he wants to be unfriendly, let him be unfriendly. I don't want nothing to do with him then. Not my dad. He still tried to do good. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And when we respond, I'm not going to talk to that person. I'm not going to do that. You know what? You have just become, you have just been overcome of evil. Evil has overcome you. Also remind yourself that you're not fighting against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6.12. Don't take it personal. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take on unto the whole armor of God. Don't take it personal. Just know that there is an invisible enemy called Satan and his demons that are using people to come against you. Don't take it personal. 
Follow the example of Jesus. We'll read this. We've got a couple more verses, and then we're going to close it. I'll ask my mother to come forward. It won't take time to, uh, a long time to read this. So, Mom, if you can, let's come forward. But notice in 1 Peter chapter 2, if you would, real quick. 1 Peter chapter 2. And because of time, I'm just going to start with verse 21. The context start with, starts with verse 18, but let's go ahead and go to verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. The Bible says, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us. Now listen to this part. Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So what did Christ do? He left us a what? Yeah. So we're supposed to follow his steps, right? And then in what context? He said in verse 22 and 23, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, here's the example he left behind. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Those are the steps that we're to follow. So when people revile us, if I'm following the steps of Jesus, I will not revile back. When people insult us, if we're following the steps of Jesus, I will not insult back. When people mistreat us in word or deed, if we're following the steps of Jesus, I will not mistreat them in return. That's truly following the steps of Jesus. Now, here's a question. How many have done a a great job in following the example of Jesus in that context. Once again, not looking for a verbal response, but I want you to consider that you have a responsibility to follow the example of Christ. How can I say I'm a Christian when I retaliate? That's not the steps of Jesus. That's not the steps he left behind for me to follow. How can I say, hey, I'm a Christian when I retaliate back when people mistreat me? And lastly, I would like to say this, and I don't have time to go through this. If you want to follow, or excuse me, if you want to resolve the anger that we carry, it's called forgiveness. Yeah. Forgive. I know there are certain wounds that have a deep, deep, deep degree of it, depending on what was done to you. And I'm sure sometimes... Forgiveness is not just this one moment. It's just, I forgive, it goes away. But if you want forgiveness, must you follow the steps that lead to forgiveness? You do. You need to follow those steps. You can read on your own in Acts chapter 7 and verse 60. I thought that was the best example besides Christ saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Because some people may justify their unwillingness to forgive by saying, you don't understand how, how much hurt I have suffered. You don't understand how much hurt I have suffered. And it's very possible I don't. It's very possible I don't understand all the hurt you suffered. But I do know this. When you experience the forgiveness of God, it will overwhelm you and compel you to want to forgive. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 60, Stephen was preaching the word, and they hated him for it. And the Bible says that they picked up stones, and they began to stone him. And right before Stephen died, you know what, you know what his prayer was? Right before he died? Forgive him. Forgive them, Lord. Forgive them. If Stephen understood the forgiveness and mercy of God so much that he cried out to the Lord on their behalf as they stoned them, yeah. forgive them. Doesn't it show how, how much we're lacking when somebody makes a certain comment? We, we, can't cry on, we cannot cry out to God on their behalf. Forgive them, Lord, for that comment. It's like right away we're just ready to fight. Forgive them. Let's grab a hold of our psalm books if you would. 